for people to relate to, to, to what, how they, you know, how they relate to this topic, uh, why they're interested in it or what they've heard about, you know, futures literacy and things like that. So that I, we, we can have a good conversation. There's only a few of us on the call. We might as well take advantage of that. Any, any any thoughts what 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 brings you to this to this conference what brings you to this session uh, I've been I've been working on this topic for quite a long time actually uh, started started thinking about the future of, 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 of education actually uh, you know, a, long, a long long time ago in the 70s so <laughs> Yes, uh, maybe uh, would you like sharing, Riel, how has the perspective changed uh, since the 70s uh, till now, right? So I think that can be one thread that we can pick up because I'm sure that there must be like a, uh, a torrential shift in the kind of thinking that you have gone through. Yeah, no, that's, that, that is, it's a good, it's a good question. It's a good reflective question. Um, I see a few others. We can use the chat as well for the, for the questions and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I think like most people, of course, we, we gain experience with our anticipatory systems. We gain experience with the way in which we use our imagination, how we relate to expectations, our hopes, our fears, uh, the things that we, that, we, that we fixate on, uh, the, the frameworks that we insist upon when describing <coughs> our futures. Um, oh, shit. Oh. I'm sorry. Um, but the, 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 you know, when I was, when I was a student, uh, so back in the seventies, um, I was very connected to the, the, the idea that, um, going to, going to university, going to school had a very specific purpose from the point of view of preparing for jobs, careers, life, etc. Uh, and, and, um, I happened to be involved, uh, at one point in Canada, um, with, uh, student politics. And one of the, the issues that was at the forefront back in that day was the relationship between, um, uh, unemployment and, and, and education. And why was it that the jobs that, that were out there, you know, how were we preparing people for the job market? Were we preparing them sufficiently? Uh, and it was very much uh, the idea that there was a kind of Causal Yo, relation. Oh, can I show you my phone and models real quick, man? Look at this. Look at this. Oh, can I show you my phone and models, man? Look at this. Look at... Oh my god, this is insane. Look at this. I'm cracked, man. Oh my god, look at this. Oh my, oh my god, I'm gonna get your one job, man. One crack, one crack, man. Can you shut the fuck up? I think we can kick them off. Shut the fuck up, you nasty bitch. I don't know how the fuck you jump on my son, you little nasty ass nigga. Shut your little bitch ass up. If you can make me host, I can take care of it. Shut up, Mary. Hmm? I'm making you the host, I guess. Yes, perfect. Thank you. And apologies for the assistance that. Not, not, not at all. In fact, uh, it's. What's amazing is that it doesn't happen more often. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this is uh, people. People. People have this opportunity to uh, to flash, and they uh, they use that opportunity. But talking about across time, the the issue of, of how we see uh, the the kind of causal relationship between going to school education and uh, the future. Uh, that's changed for me quite considerably because the simple models that I had of causality uh, and of functionality uh, have really given way to a much more um, open perspective. So uh, that, that's really the, the, the fundamental shift from my point of view is that um, I realized that I was locking myself in to a, a model of the future that not only didn't correspond to my experience, because I don't know anybody, even if you get, you know, even if you become, a, if, you, if you're a doctor or a lawyer, a mechanic or a, an accountant, um, where you get trained in a very specific tool 
in a very specific context, like a hospital or a company or something. I don't know anybody whose actual job life and job experience didn't wander all over the place. You know, went from one thing to another, had involved different experiences, things they didn't expect, things that surprised them. Because the one certainty is surprise. No, and so if, friend, if we no, set ourselves friend. up a way in which we look at no, if we set ourselves up no. in, in such a way <laughs> they're giving they're giving you a workout huh boom boom um you know we set ourselves up for certainty and we set ourselves up to be kind of afraid of uncertainty and disappointed and it was one of the things that i started to, to really uh try and work with is to say how can i shift uh the 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 expectations that i'm using how can i see things around me uh, that i can take advantage of that don't fit necessarily the future that i was thinking about before but nevertheless open up entirely new futures that i couldn't imagine and that's the 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 you know the richness and, and in fact the the beauty of of this world where the unexpected is happening all the time uh and and it can be awfully terrifying uh, in some ways, like what's going on right now in the world around us. We know with COVID, but we also with uh, the uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, that, that the world can terrify us, that it, 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 it create things happen that are that are disruptive and destructive, that are that are horrific. Um, and it's not a question of condoning these things or saying they're good or bad, but it is in part a question of abandoning the pretension that we can control, that we can that we that we can know in advance how to colonize the future and impose our current conception of the future on the future, and that way of seeing the world uh, is a fairly significant shift. In fact, I mean, I, and I, so let me just tie it into the to the point about about war, which is you know war is 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 very. Uh, evidently and obviously goal oriented you have a goal you want to conquer the bully wants to intimidate and those are goals that you have in the future um and you think perhaps the bully the the the, the invader uh believes that they're going to be better off or they're going to be safer or something in the future but this way of thinking that you can control and determine the future has shown over and over again that it doesn't work <laughs> meaning meaning i don't mean that that, that it, it it doesn't create terror and, and horrible things but the outcomes are simply not what the people expected at all i mean really not it, it doesn't preserve their empire it doesn't make them stronger it doesn't make them safer um and so one of the things that we need to, I think, really think about, and this is true about learning too, if I can relate it back to, to being a school child, is that, you know, when you're at a certain age in school, you know that the teacher knows the answer. And you know to succeed, you have to answer the teacher in a way that the teacher will consider acceptable. And this locks us into an anticipatory approach, a way of thinking about the future that is mechanistic and deterministic. And just at the time, so let's say in adolescence, when we're encountering so much ambiguity and openness, why are they going to, you know, what, what can I do to make people like me? How can I speak to my friends? How can I make new friends? How can I impress people? All things where the outcomes are very difficult to determine in advance, where there's all sorts of strange things that will happen, things that you had no idea about, novelty, uh, things that happen by you know, all sorts of experimentation and chance. Just when you're trying to begin to refine and explore those other alternative anticipatory systems, ones that are not simplistic and reductionist, you go to school and they lock you into a very simplistic and reductionist framework, which says, if you please the teacher, you will succeed. Um, to be caricature a, a little bit of the system, but it's very performance and, and ex-ante outcomes oriented. So. You know, one of the big contrasts between the way I think about the future today and the way I think about learning today is is that it, it it's radically different from what I experienced 
um, as as a, either in school or in university, um, where I where I still uh, uh, tried to 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 understand and tried to control <laughs> systems that were very deterministic uh, and very what I call these days anticipation for the future, not anticipation for emergence. Uh, and today I think that there's no doubt not only that anticipation for emergence exists, but that most of what happens in the universe actually is not done by intentional human control as if we were playing engineer or small g god able to create tomorrow. And this, this continuous reference, by the way, that we're going to create the future casts us in a role which I think is, is, uh, is very toxic. And uh, when some invader thinks they can create the future, um, we're just seeing a manifestation of that pathology. Uh, which is rampant, uh, by the way, and has been rampant for many millennia now in many human civilizations, because there are, are relatively few human civilizations that have not seen conquest and control and maintaining power systems uh, as something that's worth doing. Uh, I don't say that they knew how to do it, because I think that they often didn't, but by hook or by crook, meaning through evolutionary experimentation, they often found ways, and one of the ways is the way we use the future, and we, the way we educate young people to uh, uh, develop or refine or you know practice specific forms of anticipation, particularly planning. Um, so sorry to go on at length on that question. It's a good question though, because it's 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 really about how I've learned uh, myself. Other thoughts? I saw some other hands raised at, at one point. Hello, yeah. Um, my name's Bridget. Um, I'm really excited to be on this call. So thank you for going ahead with it in spite of all the technical difficulties. Um, yeah, you, you were asking what brings us here. So I thought maybe sure. just to give a little bit of background. Um, sure. I came to the sort of futuring space um, from a background of, of humanitarian disaster response and, um, and then teaching in that space, setting up humanitarian programs in South Africa, in, in uh, Johannesburg. And through that started working with experiential learning um, around what I guess traditionally in the humanitarian space is, is called simulation. Can you guys please be quiet? <laughs> simulation <laughs> simulation based learning and and through developing various kind of experiential um, journeys for for humanitarian practitioners from across the continent began to play with this question of time and uh, setting things in the past or in the present or this possibility of setting things in the future and the elasticity of time and how that offers so much more space not just for learning, but also for innovation and for dreaming and for... Um, and for offering a space where literally there is no box, um, not even, you know, thinking outside the box, but actually almost building the muscle, the muscles for dreaming and for imagination in a way that I realized was really powerful. Um, and and yeah, since then, I've, I've been exploring sort of developing tools and methodologies that could make use of this immersive embodied experience into possible futures, um, not necessarily just within an academic setting, but within or across organizations, um, how we might collaborate into the future um, in communities, how communities um, imagine their own collective futures. Um, and so I've been kind of working with this in various spaces. Um, and yeah, realizing how by, by holding space for groups of people to develop their own stories about the future, 
with including their dreams and their fears that that by kind of crafting that into an experience can can offer a lot of insights into how to how to be in the present in order it was interesting you were talking about this um the pathology of of believing that we can create the future and i was thinking what i found is that by collectively living an experience into into a future that there's something that can be planted in the body as a collective intention not not as as a, a belief that one can control the future but but if a collective intention is set in the present by a group of people who have experienced something very powerful almost like a, a doorway or a portal into a different um, realm that that has power in in intentions manifesting never in the ways that one would imagine them but but ha by having an intention um to hold to, to live into you kind of lean into the, the kinds of futures that we wish to co-create um and so yeah i guess that's that's the space i'm coming in from um I've also been involved in co-creating a, a, a community school where a lot of these questions of well, what kind of what what kind of learning spaces, what what do we wish to create for our children in the future? And so we're really working with this idea of an eco an ecosystem of learning, where the whole of our community in, in, in the southern Cape Town is is the school. It's not four walls, and that's been a really fascinating journey in itself. Um, but at the moment, I'm, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, around a specific question, which is how, how do we use such futuring tools specifically in relation to learning spaces, um, more traditional learning spaces like universities, for example, where the machine is so set and so, um, I guess, stuck in the past in many ways and, and, and unable to um, even if even if ind certain individuals might go through a process that helps to build those muscles of of um, yeah have, having a sense of future literacy you know having the qualities that we might need to engage in in the future where the system itself is so stuck that the individual is is almost strapped um, that that interplay between the system the systemic and and the individual agency i guess thanks thanks bridget thanks for sharing and uh and for for telling telling a bit of your story and i have to say that of course um i i i empathize with this um notion that that there are uh, very strange futures that 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 take us outside and, and I don't have a very simple answer on how that we access that in a regular way. Um, I think I think it's true that there there's all sorts of um, rituals and, and also, you know, invitations uh, and circumstances that allow us to break away from the, the futures that, that constrain our ability to sense and make sense to invent the present uh, um, and to take advantage of emergence. So I really I. You know, I think that this is this is, in a way, it's curious that the Western-dominated these days societies have such difficulty with that. I think some of the uh, indigenous communities were much more conversant with that humility uh, and also connectivity with the world around us. But to to pick up on on the on the specific question about uh, what to do, in a sense, and I just came off a call with people working in the um, mobility, border crossing, refugee, asylum, uh, migration uh, space. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, it, it's, it's um, uh, a question of choice here. There is continuity and there's difference and there are different kind of differences. And one of the things to think about is how to reform existing systems and improve them. So your point about the university. Uh, and the other is to say, well, you know, how do you get out of it entirely? And, and so your, your point about the school that you created without, without walls was trying to break out of the physical. 
the physical is a little easier sometimes than the mental because you can see it and you can <laughs> get outside it. But the expectations and the fears of the parents, but also of you know people who are learners, um, uh, are, are I think harder to overcome. And that's where I think the importance of futures literacy as a capability uh, is is actually quite important. Is that if you if you practice something, if you cultivate it. If you take an experiential learning by doing approach, which integrates ideas around wisdom, which are not knowing solutions in advance, but being in a position to welcome, embrace failure, uh, even catastrophic, you know, uh, uh, situations, and then reinvent the world around you uh, on that basis. That I think we can practice, and and here I don't I don't know how many people relate to it, but you know there's 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 the obvious examples that we know from let's call it the arts world, where in music or in dance there's improvisation, and improvisation is not the same thing as a score. It's not the same thing as choreography. It's inventing in the spur of the moment. But but we all understand perfectly well that in order to be able to improvise in jazz or in music, to be able to improvise in dance, you need to have the skill, the training, the muscles, the, 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 the ability to listen, etc. So this relationship between spontaneity and continuity, between improvisation and planning, is something that we, I think, purposefully weakened ourselves. We've, we've, we've actually crippled I use that word advisedly, but we've 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 constrained uh, for reasons which are not, I think, necessarily malicious, but did have a great deal to do with the fact that it reproduces existing power structures. Meaning, if you inhibit people's willingness to address change, meaning if you if you if you diminish people's capacity to be spontaneous and improvisational, if you render change threatening and therefore construct the idea of security as being founded in what is already known, you are rendering, you are creating a situation where the new, the different, the other person who is not the same as you is in some senses disrupted, an enemy, uh, 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 you know, a challenge, a weight. Whereas if you cultivate this capacity to be inspired, to find uh, inspiration from diversity and difference, to be sensitive to your own ignorance and, and, and actually appreciative of your ignorance because it's an entry point, a portal into discovery, exploration, and learning, um, then you're in a completely different universe, in a sense, in, in, with respect to change and and. And, and, and discovery and the creativity of the universe around us. So, I mean, I like to think that, that, that there's a capability-based approach, which is what I call futures literacy, um, that gives us a more, um, more of an opportunity to take advantage of the universe the way it is, which is inevitably the only certainty is uncertainty. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just, it's just, that's just, that's just the creative universe we live in. And I'm not saying it's good or bad, uh, it's just the way it is. And I'm also, and this is another very difficult thing for us to do, suggesting that we can step back and be much more humble about better. Meaning, you know, this takes us away from this teleological planning, playing the designer of the future, creating tomorrow role, and opens us up to the meaning and the in sensations and performativity of the present. Um, and I think the future and our imagination are really fundamental components of all this. And that if we don't pay more attention to the diversity of our anticipatory systems, if we don't pay more attention to understanding how the future enters into perception and then choice and distinguishing perception and choice, um, we really, you know, we will, we, we don't take advantage of, of this universe the way it is. Uh, by advantage, I just mean you know that's this is the this is the way it functions. So we might as well we might as well accept that we're not superior, we're not separate, we're not different. We are part of this universe. 
So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's kind of the, the direction of my thinking. Are there other thoughts in the room uh, that people want to share? Perspectives? Issues? Um, maybe I can go. Uh, hi, everyone. It's, it's, um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, just um, maybe, yeah, in, in, in responding to the uh, like initial question of, you know, why are you here? And so, so I, I must admit, I'm not really familiar with your work, but I'm really looking forward to getting familiar, especially with um, hearing what you're saying. But I guess like my, um, my experience at the moment is that I am in graduate school and it's a very interesting uh, phenomena when you think about um, when I think about how I think about the future and why I'm here what I'm doing and what people around me think um, about why they're doing so so graduate school takes tremendous amount of time and energy and mental and physical capacity and it's just funny how um yeah the, it's kind of very much disincentivized to um yeah to, to, to kind of just what you said right like um, <laughs> I think we are being constantly zoom bombed, it seems. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so so um, anyway, I I uh, I just um, it's it's kind of it's, that's I guess I, I I don't have any particular question or a or a thought, but it's it's really interesting to think how um, you know uh, there is people spend people realize very quickly usually that they are not really um that they don't really want to uh go and do what they thought they would do at the beginning of graduate school so that the training they really will not use the training that they are um doing or the, the education that they are getting in the future yet they spend the next you know five or so or more years of their life um many oftentimes being miserable you know um and so yeah so it's it's kind of interesting like I, I'm, I'm really interested in 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 um reading more and and and, and uh hearing more about about your um your thoughts and approaches because this it's it's kind of really uh yeah it's kind of it's it's really uh interesting and, and it's seeing that through my experience and experience people around me um yeah Thank, thank you, Alexandra, and and uh, I think I think a lot of people can relate. I mean, there's there's that phrase, you know, you have to pay your dues, right? Uh, you have to you have to you have to you have to suffer enough so that you can get your 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 place at the table, um, and and one wonders exactly what's being done in that context, meaning the reproducing power structures, obviously, um, but I mean, to take to take the the positive side of the issue. Um, there, there, you know, there's the question of how we create deeper knowledge. And I've always, and I, this is something that's always intrigued me, and I don't have a, a super, uh, you know, sense of where, where to look for answers around this question. But we see people in all sorts of positions, you know, including Zoom bombers, who will uh, refine their expertise, right? They will learn something, they will deepen their knowledge, they will study assiduously how to Zoom bomb us, um, and, and, and they'll become experts. And you wonder, now what curiosity, what motivation, what learning structure uh, created that, you know? And, and the thing is, is that we do this all over the place, whether it's, you know, betting on the horses or, uh, you know, understanding pop culture and, you know, following the latest star. We do, almost all humans, use our curiosity, but also the pleasure we have from learning. So whether we're learning to zoom bomb or learning to you know follow the stars fashions or whatever it happens to be we are enjoying learning and i mean it is it's certainly true that in the context of graduate school there's the there's the issue of being able to abide by the power structure to show that you can uh, conform to the canons 
uh, of teaching and the canons of uh, different theoretical or epistemological traditions, you know, so that you've, you've learned the methodology and you will apply it correctly, etc. But um, I, think, I think that, that we don't have much choice, and I've been saying actually this a couple of times today, um, but, to, but, to, but to really play in both, in both arenas, you know, we do have to conform to a certain extent and do have to test what it's like to conform um, and learn about what it means to, 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 to plan and to do things according to a plan and see how the plan goes awry and to experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and then we do have to, to do the kind of uh, other things that, that, uh, that Bridget was talking about, which is, you know, knock the walls off and, and try because it's not actually, I don't think it's actually really possible. You, I don't think you can be creative without constraints. You need certain constraints, but how can you can how can you discover and engage with those constraints that disturb you, or that disrupt you, or that take you beyond and outside? Uh, and and here again, I'm not in my field of expertise, but going beyond simply critique, because critique is what you know, and you distance from and and so I really believe very much in reform. I believe in transitional strategies, which can be aimed more towards transformation, but both reform and transition and perception are inherently connected to something that already exists, meaning the phenomenon has to emerge. Novelty, something that's unknowable in advance, is unknowable. If I tell you, you know, uh, I, want you, I want you to uh, uh, under, tell me what to do when I talk about blah, 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 and you say, well, what's blah, blah, blah? And I say, well, I don't know what blah, 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 I don't know what it is. Well, you can't. You can't prepare for that. You can't make a recipe with it. You can't do anything because it doesn't exist. Nobody knows what it means. So the unknowable is unknowable. So we are inherently dealing with emergent present and things that are phenomena that exist, even when we invent them in our heads, the new words, the new perceptions. Um, and so, you know, from the point of view of being a graduate student, having been there myself, um, you know, there's there's this there's the compromise that we have to make, uh, and there's a certain positive synergy between the known and the unknown, the discovery and the repetition, uh, finding the right balance and one that uh, satisfies your own um, pleasure at learning, uh, you know, your own delight uh, at learning is is very important. And one of the things, of course, that that can inhibit that uh, is is the degree to which one feels um, uh, kind of constrained by by the structure, by the degree to which conformity is uh, something that, that the system uh, attempts to to survey, to you know the surveillance of of your performance and your and your behavior, things like that can be very inhibiting. I mean, the thing to do though is 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 I mean, from my point of view, in any case. In the, in, the, in the university world, uh, I mean, there's a lot of scope for nonconformity if you configure it properly. I mean, in fact, there is a certain desire for eccentricity, but that requires a certain confidence. There's no question. Uh, and, and, and innovation is, you know, the mantra. But when you actually do something that's innovative, most of the time people won't understand it if it's genuinely innovative, in which case it's, you know, they say, what the heck are you talking about? And they go, oh, dear. But you say that that's actually a positive from my, from my point of view that's often that means i'm on the right track if people say i don't understand then it means oh well maybe i'm playing with something that i don't understand fully but they don't understand fully then maybe i'm on some new terrain i'm inventing something i'm i'm, I'm exploring something that at least is new to me um because i don't know how to talk about it uh, uh etc so finding a way to 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 what what i call walk on two legs um which is which is live in the world of planning and extrapolation uh, of, of the known uh, and then to be able to find ways to relax the hopes and fears associated with the images of the future you have, which is the image of the future is the professor has to understand what I've said. I need to understand what I've said. I need to know what it's about already in advance, etc. That kind of image of the future being able to relax that and 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 simply say i don't know where this is going to get me i don't know what they're going to think about it and 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 to a certain extent say i don't care because there's no way to know um and and to move away from this knowing in advance whether something is right or wrong good or bad um is is a you know is a crucial part i think of 
what in the Sanian tradition, which which has this aspect to it, the capacity to be free. So building up our capacity to be free, uh, you know, is not something that's very straightforward um, in any circumstances, whether it's a university or elsewhere. But again, being able to understand the role that the images of the future play, where those images come from, how we construct them, is from my point of view, part of uh, empowering, building the capability to, to have the capacity to be free. And in a graduate context, it can be very constraining, uh, absolutely, but potentially also liberating. I don't know if that kind of yeah, touches. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's 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 really um, yeah, really interesting to hear your thoughts. I think yeah, it's kind of like zooming. Out. Yeah, I think I think um, it, it, in theory, graduate school should have more space for creating those uh, uh, or, or sh should yeah should have. Um, uh, yeah, more space for this uh, creativity, and, and 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 I guess that's the definition of of graduate school is that you are exploring an unknown. But I think um, kind of being, um, yeah, I, I think thinking about like how how to um, incentivize the, those things and and create those spaces, you know, regardless of, of at what stage of education is is a really interesting question. And yeah, yeah, thanks for. Uh, it just it makes me think, Alexandra, the just a kind of thing, I mean, because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a certain age and have children and all the rest, but I mean, you can encourage rebellion in a number of different ways, and you can also encourage confidence in a number of different ways. And I think that, that, that there's an important issue here um, around anxiety uh, and, and, the, and the conditions in which people do things. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the class, it's, it's conventional to say, you know, the 1960s were a liberating period when people were ready uh, to, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, attack convention and, and, and throw over uh, the rights and rituals and conservatism, etc. Um, but, you know, and different periods have those different kind of associations. But my impression is that one of the things that was um, more difficult in that period and having lived through it partly myself is that we were we were we were setting things up on the backs of a period in which certainty had been really disrupted um and in which then the experience of uncertainty came out in a relatively positive way meaning the expectation after the second world war was for very obvious reasons that the Great Depression would continue and that since there had been World War I and World War II, well, it's a trend, isn't it? So there should be World War III. And, 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 and lo and behold, the destruction and the losses uh, of so much creative destruction opened up this terrain where, and it's called in the, in the, in the often referred to as the silent generation. Well, the silent generation is silent because you know, you, you can't be sure about these things. So just be quiet and wait. Uh, and whereas the generation of the 60s said, oh, yeah, we can do it. Let's throw off the constraints and create the world tomorrow. And then basically, you know, we're allowed to, to play and have fun for quite a few years, at least in, in you know, Europe and, and North America and, and the OECD type countries, and seem to think that it was a self-fulfilling prophecy because uh, we were lucky. That we could actually create the future and the dominant myth of you know silicon valley these days is create the future that's the way that's the way you can control tomorrow and this in colonizing perspective on the future um i think is 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 now very deeply anxiety inducing in the younger generations uh because for one thing it's it's it doesn't make a lot of sense i think both from the wisdom and and scientific perspectives but it puts an immense burden on a young person, you know, a graduate student such as yourself to say, what I'm doing now has to create tomorrow. And that's really oppressive, uh, I think. Um, so, so throw off that 1960s, uh, you know, uh, baby boom generation mythology, which is that, you know, we're going to throw off the constraints and, and be able to create the future because we're powerful uh, and find a more humble position uh which also gives you more liberty 
because you don't have to be high, such a high performance controller of the future. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I mean, it's one of the things that kind of kicks around in my head uh, when I see the degree of anxiety that people have today, which to me is also related to a lack of confidence. But building up that confidence um, from the perspective of saying we have to become more and more skilled, better and better at controlling, higher and higher performance, work more and more, you know, is, is, is attempting to perfect a system that makes no sense to begin with. And making it better and more high performance is just, I often make this comparison, you know, is a flat earth perspective. Uh, and the example I use is that, you know, if you believe the earth is flat and you're a policymaker or a scientist, everybody's going to say, well, tell us when we're going to fall off the edge of the earth. You know, give me a better instrument to measure when I'm going to go over the edge. I need to be able to navigate away from falling off the edge of the earth. And then somebody turns around and says, you know, you might have a wonderful way of measuring to fall off the earth, but that's not even the problem because the earth is not flat, it's round. And so you're really trying to solve entirely the wrong problem. Um, uh, you might be trying it in an interesting way. <laughs> Your methodology might be fascinating, but it's the wrong question. Uh, and so I think, you know, we have some very... Uh, uh, difficult challenges from the perspective of overcoming uh, the legacies uh, that that create, that inhibit uh, futures literacy in today's world. Uh, that's, yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, th thank you for sharing. I, I definitely, um, yeah, that historical perspective, just even being aware of that, right, is, is something, uh, uh, something really, uh, really, uh, interesting and helpful. So um, yeah, but thank you. We don't have a lot of time left. So just anybody else wants to chip in. What I can do is I can I can invite you all to Oh, Anna, okay, go ahead. Yeah, hi, I, I joined late. Um, but I'm hearing all the graduate school talk and trying to work backward toward younger, younger learners. Um, and um, the uh, sort of um, resistance and sense of irrelevance that comes from, you know, anybody telling a young person what's worth knowing, um, and including a kid, I mean. <laughs> um, uh, and on the other hand, you know, when you said, oh, it's a lot of pressure to create the world, I also, for, I mean, first of all, young people are sure that they're doomed, right? Like I work with teenagers and they all have decided they can never have kids because of climate change, you know, and it's very sad and they're sad. Um, but, um, but I also think there's some, some room to say like, um, I don't want to learn this because I don't want it to be part of the future. I don't want to, you know, I mean, I sort of have that myself. I don't want to be on social media because I refuse to believe that social media is the whole world, you know, <laughs> like something like that. That's really oppositional, but um, it's a learning choice I'm making, right? About sort of what's my, what's my complacency in the direction this world is going. Um, so I guess I'm wondering for kids, you know, there's so much pressure um, to sort of prepare them for the future, <laughs> even though their life is right now and that has as much value at any age as at any other age. There's no, and there's definitely no like bucket of knowledge that they can retain that will suddenly be relevant when they're 40, right? I, I'm trying to figure out how to think about this and how to communicate about it, partly because I'm trying to open a school and I need to explain to parents why we will not be productive, we will not make progress, we will not, <laughs> we will not be um, preparing tomorrow's leaders, <laughs> any of that. <laughs> it, it, very, very interesting questions. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for sharing. I mean, let, let, we don't have a lot of time, but I mean, a, a couple of uh, just a quick thoughts. I mean, one is, you know, despair or despondency or pessimism are choices to a certain extent, because you don't know. 
All right. Um, and, but and, to say like, well, climate change might not be happening. Is oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> climate change, climate change. You can say, I believe very deeply in climate change. But who says that the fact that most of the human habitation is currently uh, uh, on the coasts uh, and eliminating those cities over the next hundred years couldn't be positive. A uh, right. hundred years from now, the species might turn around and say the best thing that ever happened to humanity was the recognition that we live on a planet and the planet is symbiotic with us. And therefore, mm -hmm. we're, 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 we've, we've completely mm -hmm. rethought our relationship to monumentalism, to uh, immortality, to continuity of empire, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, bullying uh, and all the rest. Uh, you know, the, the idea of conquest is, is, is a predictive activity. The conquest will be beneficial to the invader. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, they have an image of the future, which says, I can control and create the future. Uh, and this, this superiority, this, this, this way of being outside of our universe uh, is, is uh, you know, is a deep and pervasive uh, malaise of a very, very young species. Uh, and, and getting beyond it is, is not obviously, learning is not easy, easy, and you don't just learn by winning and knowing the right thing in advance. And so the fact that our species is, is fucking up, uh, you know, in serious ways, and, and that, and that for, we're getting feedback, and this time it's not ideological feedback, it's not some, you know, uh, uh, genius turning around and saying, I know better how to make a better world, follow me, it's just the planet saying, you have constructed your communities, good or bad, on the basis of a certain conception, uh, a certain status of the climate, stable in certain temperature ranges, in certain rainfall. Now, you know, the, the species is adapted in nomadic ways, the species is adapted in all sorts of other ways, and, and are they inherently better or worse? I don't think so the mm -hmm. happiness and, and, and meaning of life for a nomadic person 5,000 years ago, their happiness is no better or worse than my happiness. It, these, you know, they're, they're not comparable in that way. And so, I mean, I think, I think we need to kind of stand back as a species. Uh, and, 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 you know, that kind of pessimism from a young person, that's, I don't think that's them. I think that's a, con, you know, contagion. If, if you say, if, if I said it to you in a more conventional way, my grandparents would have said, isn't it horrible, the idea of, let's say, uh, you know, gay marriage or whatever, isn't it terrible or, you know, awful to think of, of integration, for instance, um, and, 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 and you'd say, yeah, yeah, oh, yes, we need to preserve that world because they think it's going to be awful. No, <laughs> no, very glad that world's disappeared. Very glad. And I think the point you started with is there's some crucial things we need to forget that we need to let go of mm -hmm. racism, sexism, etc., mm -hmm. exploitation and oppression. So, uh, you know, I don't think we can be quiescent uh, faced with that kind of pessimism because I don't think that pessimism reflects the genuine learning and wisdom and experiential nature of what it means to be alive. Uh, I think it reflects a certain pretension and a certain uh, fear that is being transmitted from those in decline, uh, those who are in power uh, and who want to see the world continue in their mold, in their, in their pattern. And frankly, you know, it wasn't so fantastic anyhow. Uh, it was full of war, horror, terror, exploitation, and you know, oppression. Uh, good riddance, let's get on. So I mean I would I would I would invite I would invite people to a learning school where you don't know what you're going to learn in advance but you're going to learn that you know how to learn which is you know cliche but that's that's the nature of the game and 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 as we've discussed already in this call it's actually really pleasant it's really enjoyable to learn even when you learn from your mistakes and from failures I think we have to go thank you very uh, much everybody actually we have about five minutes if we want to wrap this nicely. And I'd like to, to share something as well, <laughs> if possible. Please, go ahead. Uh, I was, so, apologies, but I was with one year 
over here in this conversation and with the one the other one fighting off the bots. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know what happened, uh, but just because I, I felt it's beautiful how you how you ended this um, uh, real uh, and your last thought about you know we are inviting people to a space in which we don't know or and they won't know what they will learn but they will learn how to learn. Um, this is an experiment that we've been doing over here in Romania for about ten years. We designed and we developed a university whose main purpose was to support uh, um, the learners uh, develop the ability of learning by themselves. Um, and we've experimented with it in so many ways and shapes and forms. Um, and one of the things that was interesting about it, and I think it's connected with um, what you were earlier saying, um, I know about the, the focus of how we, we teach young people to look at the world and to understand the world. What happened for our experiment, and this was very interesting, um, we closed the project as it was about eight years ago, uh, sorry, about two years ago. Um, but what was very interesting about it is that the whole architecture of the process of the, of the project was designed around supporting young people. Um, discover and understand how they learn best by themselves, how to access learning resources, and what's relevant for them to learn at any point. Um, what we realized after developing this model for about, uh, yeah, for, for eight to 10 years, was that we basically had supported develop a space in which learners had such a high awareness about themselves, up to a level in which we haven't seen in many other places and learning spaces, many other parts of the world where we've seen, but they were disconnected from the world itself <laughs> because they were spending so much time in processes with and about themselves. Um, we developed this, this uh, program, which was called Autonomy in Learning, uh, which from what we know, uh, like we, we we started it and we haven't found any other places to experiment with it where basically for six for six to one six months to one year you receive a, a counselor for learning we called it and that was a coach supposed to help you figure out you know everything about your learning like your mechanisms your everything right the kind of learning styles you have preferences everything else um so I, I just wanted to bring this into conversation because for us, it was also very interesting that it, it was a piece of puzzle that we could not solve because basically what we became was a space in which learners and students came to discover themselves. But that was taking over the whole model. We also had learning groups in which we supported uh, people uh, develop their own uh, uh, startups or social businesses, or we had learning groups around, you know, things such as social impact or, you know, doing good on your, in, a, in your community. But then what interested directly the kids was this part about discovering themselves, because this is what they did not have in traditional education. Mm -hmm. So what, what maybe like a, a question for the last couple of minutes for you, and I don't know if Anna has anything else because I see you, you have your, your hand raised as well, but I'm curious, like, how do you see this balance? Uh, like, wh wh where's the balance between this? <laughs> I, um, can I just add to your story a little bit? Yeah. I teach, um, or I don't call it teaching. I facilitate Socratic seminars for teenagers. And we read Aristotle and Sartre and, you know, the gang. And um, it's totally group therapy. Like they really want to discover themselves. And I, I've realized like at that age, they're so existential. That's what they're like, you know, I'm not a Montessori fan, but that's like, you know, she's got these like sensitive phases things. That's the age that they're sensitive for that. And that's what they're like, you know, they're driven to learn about themselves and this really um, inward looking time in their lives. Um, yeah. I don't so just, know that there's a better way to spend their time. No, but but just, just, to, just to, to be cognizant of time, thanks so much for, for all of that. And, and I would say that, that coming out of childhood where I think that 
we are obliged to test and, and refine anticipatory systems related to survival. So don't touch the hot stove, you know, look two ways before you cross the street, uh, ask for food if you want to get fed, etc. Cry, you know, if you're a baby. Um, and, and so anticipatory systems are biologically, you know, essential. Life, all living organisms have anticipatory systems. And I think, you know, human humans, uh, when, they're, when they're young, are testing very essential survival anticipatory systems. When we move into to, uh, adolescence, you begin to encounter a lot more ambiguity uh, in, in the anticipatory context. And one of the things that we don't do a lot is refine those anticipatory systems. Um, so I think that you know, that is an issue of how to do that uh, and how to diversify them. Uh, uh, but to, to, to talk about the, the experience of, of you know, kind of inward and, and also detaching from the world around us, there's another thing that, that I mean, and, and I use the term futures literacy, as you know, uh, where I think we need to, to think about what, what that meant. When there was only one person that could read, they were special and isolated, you know. When there's 10 people, when everybody can read and write, it's a different context. And in a world today where people are planning and they want certainty and they're afraid of uncertainty and they want, you know, guaranteed uh, futures um, and they want to be able to be powerful enough to create their future, etc. If you step back from that and you move into a learning environment which says, I'm learning because it's, 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 it's creating new worlds for me and I don't know what those worlds are, you are alone. Um, you are you are isolated in the world that we're in today, like somebody who would know how to read. And therefore, we have to construct those experiences understanding those dynamics. That it's not the same at the beginning of something as when something is generalized. Uh, so there's a difference between a society where only a few people can read and a society where everybody can read. There's a difference between a, a world where one or two people have cell phones, everybody has a cell phone. Changes in the conditions of change uh, need to be you know, taken into account. Uh, and when it comes to futures literacy and the way we use the future, we live in a world that's very dominated by futures illiteracy. So if you begin to introduce different forms of wisdom, different forms of Socratic, when you begin to introduce those, you are in effect giving people, creating a situation where people are isolated. And so that can, that can exacerbate uh, you know, the, 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 some of the human tendencies we have, which is to get very uh, attached, let's not call it addicted, to certain pleasures uh, and also to a certain degree of, 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 you know, narcissism related to it's after all, I'm living this, it's my experience, that's what counts. And, and you know, be abling, enabling people to create that in a relational way, to continuously understand that they're not actually constructing that alone, that they're constructing that in a relational uh, process constantly because they're not, you know, hermits in the forest. The meaning and the sensations, the experiments and the performativity of all of that is relational. And so building the bridges, constructing it from the point of view of initiation and, and also situations of minority where you're not the majority and that makes a difference. Um, uh, understanding that that means that you have to pay attention to community and how to build the community in such a way that that it it, it empowers and nourishes uh, becomes really important. So those are design issues, by the way. And so there are crucial questions around design uh, that I hear from the point of view of graduate school, from the point of view of designing a university, from the point of view of designing a school, and all of those things need to be taken into account uh, as we co-create the design and continuously adapt it. So sorry, I'm I'm gonna have to I am gonna have to jump off. I've got I've got another call coming, um, but it was really a pleasure to to join with all of you. And by all means, you know, tap into the Futures Literacy Network. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet, um, uh, on on ResearchGate or Academia or LinkedIn or wherever it happens to be. Uh, and I'd be glad to continue the conversation.